This is Duke University. Uh, currently, uh, after I kind of spent some time at College Vine, right now I'm the college counselor at Carolina Friends School, where some of what I do is helping kids apply to college with bureaucratic stuff, uh, how to fill out these different forms, how to strategize about where they apply. But a lot more of what I do is helping uh, high schoolers plan what they want to do after they're done with high school. How are they going to, if they're going to college, how are they going to use that college well? Or if they're taking another path, how they're going to do that. So part of my work there is also, of course, teaching high schoolers how to interview. However, you all, of course, are uh, not quite high schoolers. You're rather different from that. And so what I really hope to do is rather than me like telling you, hey, this is how it's done, I was hoping we could do something a little bit more around sharing our experiences and also getting some practice and getting some feedback from each other so that we can kind of uh, hopefully build our skills together. All right, so with that, maybe I'll just kind of launch into the uh, slideshow I have here, which is really, I would say, pretty minimalistic. Uh, and then we can uh, sort of uh, get going here. All right. So first off, interviewing, colon, a participatory workshop. And that's my name and all that stuff there. But we can skip past that. So here, I guess maybe my first question that I would have is if people feel comfortable either uh, raising their hands or just typing in the chat, what experience do any of you all have interviewing? Like, have you, any of you all either been in an interview, maybe to get into your graduate program or maybe for another job? Or also, have any of you actually been in the position where you have had to interview other people? So first off, I'd just be curious to get a sense of what everyone's experience is. Yeah. I don't know, does anyone want to go first? Or like I said, you can also just share something in the chat. Yeah, uh, is that Evan there? Yeah, um, so as you suggested, I, I did have the classic campus interview experience where a bunch of professors sit in a room and interrogate you about why you wanna to come to this program, why you're a good fit. Um, and then recently um, I applied for a teaching fellow position for this year mm -hmm. in another department. So I had a, a, an interview with two professors there kind of talking about, uh experience teaching techniques things like that but i guess all my experience unless we go way back to you know undergrad and high school um, like part-time jobs has been in an academic setting yeah yeah and i guess here so as you were doing these interviews in a more academic setting what did you what do you feel like you know was there anything you felt like you noticed about those interviews or or how they were kind of conducted or what what seemed like it was important in them yeah I and mean, the, definitely the, the program admission interview was big on you know your your research interests and also i think trying to uh test you or um, almost trip you up even on academic knowledge right like just throwing oh. a hardball question like a tricky see see how you respond to it right like testing the limits of your knowledge and how quick you are on your feet mm -hmm. um i guess the, the the teaching fellowship interview i did more recently was focused on you know teaching like asking i guess deeper questions about classroom philosophy right like um you know what you could what you would do if you had had any um any chance to experiment you know no restrictions so i guess kind of probing those deeper questions right seeing like how how you think about um, teaching at a more fundamental level yeah thanks thanks for sharing that and then um dana you'd said that you'd uh uh, uh done some interviews for grad school and also for two jobs would you mind expanding a little bit on what 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 kind of that experience was like for you sure um so in e of those cases, those were closer to when I was uh, fresh out of undergrad rather than graduate school. And I think the undergraduate institution I attended was a real draw for both the employers and um, faculty. So that kind of drove the conversation, um, the work that I had done there. Um, and it was mainly focused about my experience in, in in internships and my accomplishments rather than my vision for anything uh -huh. um, you know because those were those were more positions where i'm entering somebody else's vision and supporting them rather than directing my own yeah that's really interesting so you're saying that in those interviews that i heard you correctly you felt like you were kind of like um 
you weren't necessarily coming in to do something creative and different with the position. You were sort of coming into something that already exists and they just want to know, can you do these tasks? And I think one of yeah. yeah, like, and I think one thing you'll probably notice is, um, especially as you start interviewing or looking into more professional positions, that a lot more of what you probably will be needing to do as you step into those interviews is not just saying that you could do the task, which is often very important, but also them wanting to know kind of what your idea, what your vision is, how you think creatively. And so I think maybe we'll talk a little bit more about how to dive into some of that stuff. And then uh, Paula, do you think you could say a little bit about, uh, you said you had some experience both being interviewed and also interviewing others. Do you think you could expand on that a little bit? Um, sure. Um, I guess I'm an older student, so I've had uh, probably a you know, lot of experience being interviewed for different opportunities and jobs, whether it be, um, you know, um, a job position or whether it be doing some consulting on a particular project um, or whether it be for, you know, an academic um, appointment or opportunity. Um, but then I've also been in the situation where I've been interviewing people to work for me. So mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity to have both experiences. Um, so I guess, I don't know what I, I guess one of the things that I always kind of wonder or struggle with or think about a balance of how much to talk versus how much to listen. Um, um, yeah. And, you know, I've all, I was always, I, I was aware of that both as someone interviewing and someone being interviewed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's a really interesting question. Like, because I think there's probably not one right answer for that across all interviews, but that probably varies really heavily depending on the position you're interviewing and also the, the style of the person who you're interviewing with. And so kind of playing that game of like, am I talking too much? Am I going on too long? Versus mm -hmm. like, uh, oh, am I like kind of listening too much? Am I being too quote unquote passive or something? I, I wish I could say there's probably one good answer to that, but I think you're right. That's a really interesting tension. And then, uh, and then uh, I, I hope I'm pronouncing this uh, correctly, uh, Sadna, um, you said you, you, you're kind of one of your experiences with interviewing is uh, maybe starting a little bit nervous, but then being perhaps feeling yourself becoming more comfortable as you go in a few minutes. Did you have anything else you wanted to add to that? Yeah, so I think I was mostly referring to my very first interview back in 2008. Uh -huh, and yeah. um, so over time, I definitely have uh, um, experienced that the, the personality, the nature of the interviewee, you know, how they are driving the conversation. So mostly I have been involved in academic research. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, it, it, it just depends who the person is in front of you, how how much they want to talk or how much they want to hear. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I also think the point about academic research is interesting, because especially if you are applying for a position that is not directly related in an obvious way to your academic research. So for example, where I was like applying to college counseling positions, it's not super obvious that my research into like sort of the aesthetics of bureaucracy and utilitarianism in the 19th century is directly related to sort of, uh, you know, whatever right. they're asking about how do you make um, about in terms of how do you make uh, parents more comfortable about the college admissions process. But I think one thing that you can think about a lot, and this is something I found myself going through an evolution of, especially as I was leaving graduate school and getting ready to transition to non-academic jobs, as I think, and you all may have an intuitive sense of this already, I think sometimes whenever you're in grad school, you can sometimes think, at least certainly I did, that um, what I do in grad school is my research and my primary skills or what I have to offer just in my head period is the very specific niche topic that I have learned so much about. But I think maybe one thing we can talk about a little bit today and expand on is while you're in grad school, you are doing a lot of different things. You are teaching, you are collaborating with other people. Maybe you are doing editing or journal writing 
Uh, maybe you are um, uh, coordinating things with different kinds of undergrads. Maybe there's ways in which you're building communities outside of immediately what might be happening in your graduate program. And all of those things are part of the stories and part of the skills that you can bring to a position. And so certainly your research can matter and it can be interesting to talk about how that speaks to what an organization might specifically want. But maybe one of the things we'll be talking a little bit about today is thinking about how to, how to realize the vast, vast array of different kinds of skills and experience you already have. And so let's kind of just uh, uh, go forward a little bit here. Thank you all for sharing. I really appreciate that. I know that Zoom can be a little bit uh, uh, weird. And so one thing, whenever I was thinking about this presentation, I was like, ah, I, maybe at some point I should try and give some just like the basics of interviewing and like say that. But then I, I found this video and I was like, well, I'm not going to improve on this video in terms of what I'm going to say. So I thought we could just watch this brief five minute in video that I think gives a pretty good framework for how to think about how to prepare for an interview. And then we can maybe kind of use and practice with that framework a little bit together. Sound good? All right. Awesome. Uh, in order to prepare for an interview, it's important to research in three areas. First area that you want to research is you. You want to research yourself, basically a summary of your qualifications, your relevant qualifications. You want to ask yourself how you can meet the employer's needs, what you bring to the table, and how you can add value. Then you also want to make sure that you research the position. You want to have a clear understanding of what an XYZ does. Okay, again, meeting the needs of the position. You also want to research the employer. So they may say, why do you want to work for us? What do you know about us? So who's the CEO, history, products, services, competitors, etc. And then finally, I would say that you want to research the industry as well. So you, the position, the organization, and the industry. You want to make sure that you've prepared a series of short, relevant stories. Okay, about yourself. It's something called the show and tell method. So you don't just want to say like, these are my skills. You want to be able to demonstrate, to have short relevant stories that have a beginning, a middle and an end. I would recommend that you practice at the very least, lock yourself in a room with a mirror and practice uh, responses to commonly asked questions. You don't want to script it. You're not an actress. You want it to be conversational, but you want to hear yourself uh, say these responses out loud. And if possible, I would recommend that you set up a mock interview with a professional career counselor. You want to make sure that you arrive on time. I generally say arrive 30 minutes in the vicinity, but about 10 to 15 minutes to announce yourself in the reception area. Then once you meet, your interviewer, first impressions matter. And studies say it takes about seven seconds. Um, a prospective employer is immediately sizing you up. He or she is deciding, do they like you? Are you intelligent? Are you kind? Okay. Um, you want to have good eye contact. You want to have a nice, strong handshake. And you basically want to be positive, confident, and upbeat. So watch your energy level. You want to be authentic and genuine, but most people need to turn up the volume slightly. There are basically three types of interviews. Um, some common interviews are now behavioral interviews. They begin with questions like, tell me about a time when. Tell me about a time when you were in a team and things went really well or things didn't go so well. You might have a technical interview. This might be perhaps you're going for a software engineering position. You might walk into the interview and they say, don't sit down. And they direct you to a whiteboard, give you a marker, and they want you to solve some algorithms. Perhaps you will have a case interview if you're interviewing with consulting firms. So you want to be well prepared for those in terms of practicing case questions. Telephone and Skype interviews are becoming more and more common, particularly for initial interviews. With a telephone interview, if you can get a landline, that's best. If not, make sure everything is charged up. You also want to make sure that you're in a quiet environment and that no one is going to disturb you. So the advantage is you don't have to worry about what you're wearing or what you look like. And you can have lots of notes, but you want to be organized. You want to make sure that you pace yourself, 
the tone, your articulation, that the energy comes forth within the telephone call. With a Skype interview, again, you want to test your equipment, make sure everything is working properly. You need to think about what you're wearing because you're going to be on camera, have something colorful, <laughs> watch the whites, the blacks, the patterns, etc. cetera. Um, watch the lighting in terms of like uh, fluorescent lighting with a Skype interview. And even though it, it might be your natural inclination to look at the screen, it's important to look at the camera. That's how you'll be making eye contact. And then finally with a Skype interview, I would watch your background. Be very much aware of your background. So at the end of the interview, I would recommend that you establish next steps. Some employers will tell you what the next steps are, but if they don't, it's perfectly fine to ask what are the next steps. I would also recommend that you have a closing statement at the end of the interview to let the interviewer know that you're very interested in the position and why you would be a great fit and match. Then in terms of once the interview is over, of course you wanna send some type of thank you. It, it's probably going to be an email, but depending upon your audience, could be a short thank you note. In your thank you, you want to make sure, of course, that you thank the interviewer for their time, but also it's an opportunity to reiterate your interest and your qualifications. And I recommend that you send the thank you within 24 to 48 hours. All right. So that was very brief, but I feel like the video gives some good framework, some good general information. And I guess here, though, uh, just to kind of pause and reflect on the video briefly, you all can either type in the chat or if you want, uh, raise your digital hand. What suggestions from the video resonated with you? Or were there things that that discussion of interviewing did not address that are kind of on your mind? I'd be curious if you all, uh, uh, what, what suggestions either resonated with you or seemed like that seemed like a good, uh, uh, yeah, is that uh, Dana? Yeah, go on. Thanks. Yeah, so um, two things that were mentioned I have follow-up questions on, and one thing that wasn't mentioned I have a question about. Um, so the first two are, are sort of short, you know, thinking about Zoom interviews or Skype interviews um, and background, what do you advise for background these you know if right now i've got the blurred background yeah. versus having a green screen versus have you know having a view mm -hmm. into a an office space um yeah i mean yeah that's great so so i think that's a great question i would say here the background that i have is probably not optimal <laughs> um so perhaps here i could uh model this a little bit better i think the main thing you'd want for a background is something that's not distracting Mm -hmm. So the background that you have that's kind of blurred out, I think that that's uh, good. Um, that would be the main criteria I'd say there is non-distracting. Um, probably more important than the specific backdrop you have behind you would be the idea of being in a space where you're not going to be interrupted. And also, and I think I want to emphasize this, being in a space where you are comfortable. So like, uh, obviously, you want the interview to have what it needs in terms of being presentable, but also you want yourself to be comfortable as well. If you're like, ah, I need to go to this like strange office that will be like the perfect space, but it's a space I've never been in before. Uh, I don't know. I would, I would, I would, I would err on the side of being somewhere where you feel like you're comfortable and you can be your full self. Uh, other Thanks. questions, though. Um, so my other question that was brought up in the, in the uh, video is about thank you notes. So mm. I personally. Um, tend to go with the handwritten thank you note. However, you know, it, unlike an email, there's no guarantee that it's going to reach the person mm -hmm. in a timely manner or at all. However, when when people have received my thank you notes, you know, my advisor here at Duke still has mm -hmm. the thank you note from when I interviewed on her windowsill. So, you know, what what is your advice about mm -hmm. handwritten versus email? And then if you choose to do both, um, how do you dif differentiate your message in each rather than repeating yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess one thing that I would say is email can be especially good, especially because it's more likely that they will see that on a time frame that is relevant for the interviewing committee making a decision. 
The other thing I would say is that certainly if you like, sometimes it's hard to know if you send like, unless you have like the person's home address, which might be a little creepy if you did, it can be a little hard to know if the hard, uh, the, if the hard copy card could sort of uh, get to there. Um, but certainly if you want to do both or you feel like that's kind of part of how you want to show up in that professional space, I think what I would say in terms of um, differentiating the two, you're right, you probably don't want to repeat the exact same thing. For If you're sending the email, one thing that can be kind of good is like the presenter, like the video was suggesting, emphasizing your qualifications. And something that I often like to do is say like, hey, I really appreciated your question about X. And especially after the interview, it makes beyond what I said, it makes me kind of think about this. That can so that can be a good way of kind of being quickly in contact through email. Um, a handwritten card, I mean, maybe less responding to a specific question they may have asked you or a specific thing, and could be just a little more generally like, I really appreciated how you all welcomed me into the space and something more along those kinds of lines. Um, but I, I would say you probably do want to send an email to everyone because that is more likely to get found, especially if they're like, you know, saying, oh, we interviewed this person. What was their name? They'll like do a search in their email and then your thank you or your uh, follow up message will be right in there. Yeah, great questions. Thank you. And then my last question that wasn't um, raised in the, the video is what are the conventions for addressing people these days? You know, so back when I started interviewing, you absolutely would say, dear Mr., dear Miss, but you know, that was before, um, you know, different, mm -hmm. different types of pronouns were becoming more popular. And also now we, we've kind of shifted generally, it seems to me into a more formal first name um, kind of space in certain industries. So, you yeah, know, yeah. what is, what is, what is the safest mm -hmm. thing to do? Yeah. Uh, so I would say the safest thing to do is dear, insert first name, insert last name. Okay. And then if they have a doctorate or something like that, dear doctor, first name, last name. Um, I would say uh, uh, my own pref my own default would be not defaulting to Mr. or Ms. or something like that. Um, you know, but it may very well be the case that in certain industries, or if you like look up someone's like public per presentation, if their public presentation is like website for Mr. Lionel Burkhart or something, and that's how they're identifying themselves in their public presentation, then you might consider going along with what their public presentation is. The other thing that you brought up that I think is an interesting thing is the idea of conventions that may be more true of one industry than another. And I think here the crucial thing is, um, if you remember the interviewer was saying, one thing that's really important is to research the industry that you're planning to go into. And the way of knowing what the particular conventions might be for a particular industry would be reaching out to do something like an informational interview with someone in that field to kind of learn a little bit more about like, hey, how do people tend to introduce it, interact with each other in that space? So just as a random example, I'm at a Quaker institution uh, and the Quaker institutions, we are, everyone is a first name thing here. They're, I'm not Dr. Walshman, not to the students, not to my other colleagues, I'm just Stefan. And so uh, uh, I would, I always think it's a little bit weird if someone emails me and says like, hey, Mr. Walshman or hey, Dr. Walshman rather than Stefan. But that's like weirdly specific to a Quaker institution. And so here, I think a way to kind of get a sense of that is if you can find a way to do an informational interview with either someone who's in that industry and has a better sense of what industry specific norms might be, or also even someone who is at that company already to get a broader sense of what their culture is and how they tend to do things there. Yeah, great question. Thank do you. other people have, yeah, do other people have other questions or other things they were curious about either in this video or, uh, or, or about other things that are on their mind at this point. Uh, hi, I also wanted to ask a few questions. One is also about the thank you note. Uh -huh. So uh, for my last interview, I decided to, because uh, it's only with two people, it's like a tiny team, like I'll be the number three. So I waited, like I didn't send them a thank you email right away after the interview, because they tell me like they will make the decision pretty quick. And mm -hmm. I decided to wait until they gave me the decision, which is like, sorry about whatever, uh, until 
write a thank you email about like emphasizing like what I learned from this interview. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, ha like, so this is not conventional, and I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. Well, well, actually, I guess one thing I would I would say two two things about that. So yeah. one thing is I would say you do probably want to send them a a note of some kind of thanks as relatively soon after you've interviewed, like ideally within 24 hours, just so that again, you can emphasize that like, hey, I've I've I thought about what we had our conversation about and uh, uh, it was meaningful and useful for me to learn more about the position and all that kind of stuff and just to sort of show your appreciation. However, I would also say what you did in terms of sending a note to people after the decision was reached, whether that decision was to uh, hire you or to not hire you, I would say that can also be a really good practice. Because I think one thing that's also worth emphasizing is that if they have been interested in you enough to interview you, it may be that you weren't the right fit for that position at that company, but it could be possible that, especially if you were like saying, hey, I really appreciated learning this, like maybe they email you and say, hey, you're not a, a right fit for this role. If you email them back and say like, hey, I definitely appreciate that. One thing I really learned from the interview was this and this, and I really appreciate this about our conversation. And mm -hmm. maybe your cross will pass down the line. That can be actually a really powerful way of um, continuing to network and keeping a conversation going. Um, I myself, I know there are people that I have interviewed that we didn't end up hiring where afterwards I was like, huh, we didn't hire that person, but boy, would they be good for insert blank or blank or blank, or boy, they were just a really interesting person. I'd love to talk to them again. So I think your point, so I guess I would say it's not wrong to do what you did, send that email after the decision is made, um, but that I probably would say it would be a good idea to also send one uh, as soon after the interview is done as possible. So if it's only one round, then how will the, these two thank you notes be different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so so here again, if it's only one round, um, like uh, again, you're sending one note after the interview is done, and you're hopefully before they make their decision. Now, it, it may if you later hear that you're not that you're you're not hired for that position then mm -hmm. you can send that second note that is less like hey i really appreciated the interview looking forward to talking more and the second note might be more like hey i really learned a lot of valuable things for the company uh and i'd be interested in continuing a conversation later so i would mm -hmm. say that would maybe be the differentiation a little bit does that make sense yes yeah yeah Thank yeah, you. Awesome. Uh, and I have another question about like, um, so one of the interviews that I had is like, it wasn't really an interviewing like to assess me. It's more like a introduction of the job and the company, which feels weird. So how do we have a sense of like how the interview is going by like the proportion of the, their, their, their like self introduction and their questions mm -hmm. for me? Yeah, that's interesting. I would say that's, again, something that varies tremendously by industry and by position. I think you do are pointing to something that's really important, which is that in a lot of interviews, it's not just always for them to um, ask you questions. Oftentimes, a part of the interview is them also informing you about the job itself, what it actually entails. Because there's the job ad that you'll read that they'll have posted online, but oftentimes there might be other aspects of the job that they really want to clarify for you. And I think another thing to think about is as they are telling you about the job, it can be really good to ask meaningful questions about what your responsibilities will be. But ideally those questions should be sourced in the fact that you already have some understanding of the position. And here, this is where if you can talk to someone else at the company or other people in the industry before you go into the interview, that can help you ask meaningful questions about the job itself. Uh, I guess I would say is that if you're in the interview and it seems like they're taking up a ton of time to just tell you thing after thing after thing about the job and not really asking you any questions, you can kind of start to create more of a conversation 
by doing something like breaking up their description of the job and saying something like, oh, what you're saying about that is really interesting. Can you tell me more about this specific thing? Because I'm kind of curious about this. So mm -hmm. if feeling like the interview is like not allowing you to actually share your voice, especially if they're giving a long description, there are ways for you to kind of actually create a little bit more of a conversation by asking questions and being engaged with the information that you're given. Uh, I think it's more about like, if they don't have any question for me, like they don't, they're not assessing me in any way, then what okay. does that imply? Because it means uh, they don't need any additional information to make the decision. So does it mean like they, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot. Well, oh, they didn't like me at all. Yeah, I don't know. I guess that's really interesting. It's rather, I would say, it's relatively unusual for you to go into an interview where the understanding that they will be asked is that they'll be asking you questions, and for them to ask you no questions. Uh, that that I would just say is very unusual. Indeed, I would say that's. I would venture to say it's almost so unusual that I would wonder if that says anything particular about you versus if it says something about a hiring manager who might not be quite clear on what the interview itself is per se. I don't know. That that seems to me very unusual. I don't know if other people have had an experience of an interview where you weren't really asked questions. I mean, I just had one this Monday. That's how it went, and yeah. I was. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, like I said, that seems strange to me. And uh, and I think this points, though, to something useful about interviews is that sometimes it can get very easy to be like to like kind of over interpret every, every particular moment of like, oh, if they ask this question, does that mean they like me or what? Um, mm -hmm. I would say that the main thing you want to do in an interview is tell and share your story. And if someone seems kind of tired or bored or something, uh, there's actually a reasonably good chance that it's not you. There's a reasonably good chance that they just happen to have like not had a big enough lunch that day. So um, also like, you know, it, it, you are in there, you're trying to present your best self. And oftentimes mm -hmm. the employers are trying to present their best self as well as they're interviewing. But mm -hmm. there's all kinds of variation in, uh, in humans and how we show up. Uh, um, yeah which makes, makes it hard to learn from like how I did in the previous interviews. So I could do better in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then uh, and then I think you said, uh, uh, Danny, you were saying you had you had an interview with someone who repeatedly described themselves as a storyteller. And you were saying they kind of just told a lot of stories. Is that sort of what happened? Yeah, know. so it was a, a similar situation where they were doing most of the talking and not asking very mm -hmm. many questions. And I really had to try to insert myself into the conversation. But yeah. in that case, I got the sense that it was somebody who had really developed the position that I was applying for. And I think they were trying to process their own feelings about what they had accomplished with the position rather than focusing yeah. on whether I would be a fit for it or not. Yeah, yeah. And and I guess here what I would say is just because there are interview best practices, um, there's all kinds of uh, 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 interesting research and best practice about how one ought to conduct an interview. Just because those best practices exist does not mean that that is what you will encounter whenever you are interviewing for something. Um, so I think that is definitely something to be aware of. And so here, I guess one thing I wanted us to start doing a little bit in the last uh, 20 or so minutes that we have here is I guess maybe practicing a little bit that skill that, um, that the, uh, uh, the video had mentioned, that skill of, so, so maybe it's not such a good a, a thing if your interviewer is always like using the interview as their time to tell their stories, but certainly in your interview, you want it to be your time to tell your stories. And here, I guess one thing to think about as you're preparing for an interview is you wanna first off, as the video suggested, research the position. What is the position? What does it entail? Like what are the different duties? then those different duties will require particular kinds of skills. So what are the relevant skills? And then what you can start to do as you're preparing for that interview is after you've identified the relevant skills, then you can think about your own experience. What are the stories from your life, from your experience as a grad student, from your experience working, from your experience teaching, maybe even potentially from your experience volunteering or getting involved in your community? What are the stories that you can tell that in fact demonstrate that skill? 
So here, I'd just like us to pause for a second and think in your head, try to imagine a position that you're going to apply for. Let's just take a second and maybe as soon as you, you're thinking about a position you might feasibly apply for, maybe middle school teaching, maybe uh, user experience design, maybe anything like that. I'd like you all to maybe put in the chat a position you're thinking you might apply for, even if it's completely fanciful right now, and then a skill that is relevant to that position. So if everyone could put in the chat a position you think you'd like to apply to and a skill that you feel like would be relevant to that position. Yeah, maybe this is a bigger question than I intended it to be, because maybe some of you are like, I don't know what I'd apply to outside of academia. If so, that's okay. Uh, for the purposes of this, you can just invent something. Yeah, awesome. So we've got student advisor and maybe mentorship and coaching, high school teacher working with students from diverse backgrounds. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, uh, and, and if, if other people have one, you can go on ahead and put it in the chat. Okay, so we're gonna hold on that for a second and we're gonna maybe practice a little bit with that. Um, so now the other thing I would say here is in terms of how to answer an interview question, like sometimes whenever people give these kinds of presentations, they'll go over all the most common types of interviews and interview questions and give suggestions for how to answer each one. And certainly we can maybe talk about that a little bit, but I think for me, the thing that's the most relevant is to think about how you, oops, how you structure a response to a question. So any question that you're asked, whether that question seems to be asking for a story or doesn't seem to be asking for a story, I would argue that you want to try to insert some kind of specific story that can demonstrate the skill you're trying to articulate that you have into your answer for the question. So for example, if they ask you, hey, what's one of your greatest strengths or weaknesses? Uh, uh, if you say like, oh, one of my greatest strengths is I feel like I'm good at talking with and connecting with other people. What you should really do is illustrate that with a specific relevant story. I would even say if you get, and this is something that uh, at least at my school, whenever the student interview committee is interviewing teachers and staff who are coming in, they will always tend to ask that person uh, who's interviewing, like, if you were a kitchen utensil, what kind of kitchen utensil would you be? So that's just the kids being the kids. They want to see that you're a little bit creative and stuff, but just saying like, oh, I'm a spatula, like, okay, well, that's, what does that mean? You can say like, because they're not actually asking you what kitchen utensil you are. They want to know how do you relate to their questions. So you could say something like, hey, I think I'm a spatula because I feel like I'm really good at taking things that seem one way and turning them around. For example, whenever I was uh, working as a camp counselor, we had this really rainy day and stuff and all the kids were really, you know, uh, sad or depressed. And I turned that around or tried to help them realize they could turn it around by doing this. And so here, taking whatever question you get and turning that question into an opportunity to tell your story, that is how I would generally suggest you do that. And so here you want, they ask you a question, you give the general idea, you give them some kind of short, specific, relevant story, relevant to that skill. And then at the end you of your answer, you kind of return to that general idea. So I'm gonna give you all a, mo a minute, a few minutes to practice with this with each other, but just to get us started here, does anyone want to volunteer bravely to try in front of the group, try practicing this skill? I ask you a question, you answer it with some kind of nice relevant uh, story. Anyone want to uh, volunteer up, give it a try? Yeah, Dana, thanks, wonderful. So I'm just going to uh, click over to the next slide here. I've got a range of different questions. Dana, which question would you like me to ask you? Ooh, I will go with number two. Okay, tell us about approach. Okay, and then uh, what kind of position are you thinking you're going to be interviewing for? Um, possibly uh, student student advising. Um, okay, great. In the academic space. Okay, wonderful. All right, great. So Dana, can you tell us? about how you approach diversity, equity, and inclusion or belonging in your work. Thank you very much. Um, so throughout my different experiences over the past four years, I have really focused on becoming a mentor to 
both my colleagues and to students around me. And I've found through these mentoring activities that I've particularly been able to have an impact on the lives of students who are possibly first generation or who are um, representing a, you know, a different sort of person than is, is uh, predominantly found in their field. And through working with these students, I've gained a greater appreciation of how, how I need to have um, diverse strategies to support diverse learners. And I've also gained a better appreciation of how I can structure my research um, to better serve diverse communities. Now, uh, so that that's the end of my answer, but I'm realizing as I'm listening to myself that that was really vague and not specific. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I was going to ask you in a second, how do you feel like that went? Okay. So, so if you're feeling like that was vague and non-specific, what are some strategies you think you could employ to make it less vague and more specific? If I were to pick one example of working with one specific student mm -hmm. or in one specific setting, um, I think that would that would make it stronger. So I, mm -hmm. you know, re revising that, I would probably talk about um, a student who was a young woman. Um, she's a person of color, and I worked with her over the course of two years. And I recently, she recently asked me to write her a letter for her law school applications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. And I think I think there you're right. You want to get to that one specific uh, that one specific story. Are you also open to a little bit more feedback on the answer that you gave potentially? That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, sure. So the other thing I would say is whenever you were starting to give your answer, you had a lot of different ideas in there. Yeah. And you were kind of trying to cover sort of it felt to me a little bit like you were trying to cover everything. Yeah. And in some sense, that can be good because you're like very confident you can and you do have a lot of skills. You are covering a lot of things. But especially, at least for me as a listener, maybe other people are better at listening to a lot of different ideas at once. Oftentimes, to have a crisp, clear answer that's understandable by other people, you want to think about, okay, they're asking this question. What's the one specific idea I want them to come away from this question with? What's that one specific question? quest idea, that general specific idea, and then what's the story that can illustrate that specific idea really clearly, and then as you go out of that story, hitting that specific idea again, you almost want to think about it like what's the theme or like bumper sticker that you want your interviewer to come away from asking that question with. Uh, yeah, I think I saw someone else put something in the chat there. Oh yeah, someone else was putting uh, a, a uh, uh, their, their, their other thing. All right, so we've gotten a little bit of practice here. And what I'd love for us to do, though, is if we could go into, uh, I, think, I think we have the ability to put people in breakout rooms. I would love you all to take the opportunity to just practice interviewing each other. You know, you can tell your partner, hey, ask me this question. They'll ask you the question. You'll try your best in real time to uh, respond to it. And then uh, uh, maybe we can give like about, and then you and then you all can try and do the reverse. Practice whenever it comes to interviewing makes perfect. Interviewing is a skill that you learn and you learn it how? By practicing. So we may as well uh, give it a try right here. <laughs>